Okay, so, seen against the grand and decisive battles of the First World War, the Battle of Hamel appears to be a relatively minor event. Taking place on the 4th of July in 1918, the attack lasted for a total of 93 minutes and involved the effective coordination of four major arms, infantry, artillery, air power, and armor. It may not have been the event that changed the course of the war, but Hamel has been praised regarding its influence on the Allied position and, and the impact on future events. Reckon for this, recognition for this has often been attributed to Sir John Monash. While he's been a highly capable commander, it's important to recognise that this battle is appreciated as part of the represent, representative lessons acquired by the British and Dominion armies during the First World War. Independently used throughout the war, the cooperation between these four arms at the Battle of Hamel was largely experimental. Monash acted as part of a multi-skilled team to test a new combined strategy against the German army. To show this, I will be focusing on two innovations, tanks and aerial ammunition drops. I will then look at the incorporation of these advances into the creation of the battle plan, how the different arms cooperated during the battle itself, and the lessons and aftermath of the event. The purpose of this presentation is therefore to highlight how Hamel acted to test the effectiveness of this new combined approach. So following the rise of the Bolsheviks to power in November 1917, Russia withdrew from the war. This led to the transfer of more than a million German troops to the Western Front to take part in the spring offensive. Known to the Germans as Operation Michael, the goal was to reach Amiens. Achieving this would drive a wedge between the British <coughs> Army in the north and the French Army in the south. In the end, the Germans failed and were stopped at Villers Bretonneux, a mere, mere 20 kilometers from Amiens. Despite this, exceptionally heavy casualties were experienced by both sides. For most of the war, Hamel had been several kilometers behind the British front line but it was during the spring offensive that the German army claimed the village of Le Hamel and the surrounding areas. Despite this, the German army held a relatively important position, but its morale was seriously depleted and defenses were uneven along the front. After Monash's promotion to the commander of the Australia Corps in June 1918, he ordered a series of raids along the front known as peaceful penetration. The success from these informal daylight raids allowed for gradual progress and boosted the morale of the Australian troops. Yet the 2nd Australian Division, which was located north of the Somme River, was experiencing inflating flyer, fire along their right flank from the Germans in the south. This was the result of a salient, which is indicated in this map by the red dotted line just up here, that encompassed the village of Hamel, as well as the nearby Hamel and Vare Woods. Assaulting Hamel would straighten the line and act as a springboard from which the Allies could launch their own counter-offensive. Hamel was less heavily defended than the rest of the line. The trenches were badly constructed and the wire was minimal. As stated previously, the morale of the Germans in this area was seriously depleted. Yet despite these weaknesses, there was an acute awareness that the Australian divisions had all suffered heavy casualties, with 15,000 experienced during the beginning of 18, 1918. This raised questions as to whether an attack on Hamel would be worth the cost to the AIF. Three years of experience on the Western Front revealed a serious need for firepower to support the advancing infantry. This resulted in a steep learning curve as the British and Dominion forces began to develop new technologies and tactics to overcome the challenges of trench warfare on the Western Front. While progress was slow and often costly, 1918 saw the introduction of an array of weaponry that could be successfully used in a mobile offensive capacity. The sporadic use of tanks throughout the war had resulted in a suspect rep reputation. While their destructive power could be extensive, early variants were slow, unreliable, and had limited maneuverability. They were prone to being knocked out of action by anti-tank ammunition, get ditched in unseen trenches, and incapacitated by tree stumps. This was evident when the Australians first worked alongside tanks at Bullecourt in April 1917. During this time, the tanks either were late or didn't show to support the 4th Australian Division, leading to over 3,000 casualties. 
The result was a deep-seated distrust in tanks for offensive actions, especially among those of Bulacor. Advancements in tank technology culminated with the introduction of the Mark V. The tank could move as fast as a running infantryman, was able to be driven by one man as opposed to four, had better visibility and increased turning power. While these changes improved the capability of the tank for offensive action, the distrust by the, of the tanks by the infantry was a serious impediment to their usage and would need to be overcome if they were to cooperate effectively. While some limitations still plagued the Mark V, the commander of the tank corps, Brigadier General Hugh Ellis, recognised their offensive potential. On 3rd of January 1918, he wrote to General <coughs> Headquarters, imploring them not to underestimate the capacity of the tanks. He believed that every effort should be made to supplement the manpower at our disposal with machine power. He then suggested that if the infantry was to be, and I quote, trained to cooperate with tanks and airplanes, not only will its potential hitting power be increased many times, but, the new, but a new method of warfare may be inaugurated against which the enemy is at present impotent. In June 1918, Captain Lawrence Wackett of the Australian Flying Corps was commissioned to develop a method for dropping small arms ammunition to troops on the ground. This appeared to be inspired by a similar tactic used by the Germans during the spring offensive. As with the use of tanks, the intention was to save casualties and provide the troops with a sufficient supply of, ammuni of ammunition rather than encumber them with extra equipment during their assault. Wackett's design involved attaching parachutes to ammunition boxes and placing them in the bomb rack of RE-8 reconnaissance aircraft. Preliminary dis experiments determined that these boxes could be dropped from a height of 300 metres, landing within 90 metres of their target. While Wackett was not Im immediately informed of the intention of this ex invention, the experiments were successful, and it was determined that the technique would be used in the near future. <coughs> Recognising the need to straighten the, straighten the front line while limiting the number of casualties, both the commander of the 4th Army, General Henry Rawlinson, and John Monash saw the potential of using the tanks in the forthcoming attack. As such, they sought the expertise of Brigadier General Anthony Courage of the 5th Tank Brigade, requesting him to develop a proposal for Hamel. The initial result was primarily a tank operation. <coughs> the tanks would support the infantry with some air involvement in the form of noise cover. The idea of the idea of this was to remove the need from a, for a protective artillery barrage, replacing it with the firepower of the tanks. These decisions were based on intelligence that revealed Hamel as a soft target, perfect to pra for practicing the effectiveness of a new coordinated approach. Determined to ensure that all aspects were fully understood by all levels, several conferences were conducted through which secrecy was paramount and written orders were limited. Each conference only included individuals for the, that were directly relevant to the current planning stage. As the plans developed further and became more complex, more officers were added to provide their expertise. <coughs> the final conference included 250 officers, 133 agenda items, and ran for four hours and 20 minutes. Every point had to be settled upon as it came up, as there was no alterations allowed once a decision had been made. It was the first conference, however, on the 25th of June that key modifications took place, namely in regard to the nature of the operation. Chief of Staff, Chief of Staff Officer Brigadier General Thomas Blamey, Commander of the Australian Artillery Brigadier General Walter Coxon, and the 4th Australian Division Commander Major General Ewan Sinclair McLagan all took issue with the heavy reliance on tanks. Outlining the advantages and disadvantages determined that the artillery method was more certain, while the tank method would be more of an experiment. While tanks could provide a surprise attack, the uncertainty of their mechanics and lack of training with the infantry outweighed the benefits. To satisfy these concerns, while also allowing the experimentation with tanks, the modified plan incorporated a creeping barrage from the infantry, which lifted in two and three minute intervals, 10 yards at a time. The tanks would act to support the advance of the infantry and cover in ammunition drops provided by the aircraft. 54 tanks from the 5th Tank Brigade would take main body and reserve positions, but none placed in front of the infantry. British, French and Australian artillery units were to provide the protective creeping barrage and supported bombardments on the flanks of the attack area. Number three squadron of the Australian Flying Corps would pro provide noise cover for the tanks and bombing support, while 12 RE-8 aircraft of the number nine squadron 
of the Royal Air Force were to, to carry the ammunition parachutes. From the Australian Infantry, the men came from the 4th, 6th and 11th Brigades across three separate divisions, as well as four companies of the 33rd American Division who were incorporated into the Australian battalions to gain first-hand battle experience. <coughs> Prior to the attack, tank training took place at the Tank Corps headquarters north of Amiens. Here the tanks not only, dis not only displayed their ability to overcome strong points such as wire and machine guns, but also taught the troops how to communicate using a bell pull at the rear of the tank and phosphorus grenades to indicate areas of resistance. A report from the 43rd Battalion indicated that training inspired a newfound confidence in the tanks and good liaison was kept between the officers at all times. The writer of the report claimed, and I quote, the tank officers attended some of the battalion conferences and dined with us so that a real spirit of friendship and confidence was promoted. This training and trust would prove to be essential on the battlefield. Zero hour for the operation was 3.10 a.m. and the battle worked like clockwork. Estimated to take 90 minutes, all object objectives were reached in 93 with minimal difficulty. While the immense detail of planning through conferences was no doubt important to the, the success of the battle, the coordination of the four independent arms has often been described as the battle's legacy. To deceive the enemy in the days leading up to zero, scheduled aircraft flew overhead while the artillery conducted a systematic process of harassing fire that included both smoke and gas shells. At zero minus eight minutes on the morning of the attack, the noise of the aircraft covered the sound of the tanks but did not alarm the Germans that anything was out of the ordinary. Smoke shells were launched to visually cover the advance but gas shells were emitted. The hope was that the Germans had associated such an attack with gas shells and would put on their masks. By doing this, their vision would be impaired and would provide the infantry with a greater adva advantage. The training with tanks proved to be of great value as the infantry was able to signal towards areas of resistance effectively. Moreover, the tanks affected, negatively affected the morale of the Germans and influenced the capture of approximately 1,600 prisoners. The tanks also provided the infantry with opportunities to occupy the ground, proving to be a valuable offensive weapon. In addition to providing noise cover, number three squadron bombed enemy, enemy battery positions and horse lines to act as a diversion. Number nine squadron dropped ammunition to infantry in selected locations, as well as responded to signals from machine gunners for more ammunition. These airplanes dropped over 100,000 rounds in total. While the attack was a success, the new technologies were untested on the battlefield. They were not unique to the Australia Corps, but drew on lessons learned throughout the British and Dominion armies in over three years of fighting in France. The plan and the battle worked flawlessly, presenting the demoralized Germans with a full-scale offensive in miniature. Yet it's important to consider that the morale of the Australian infantry was high, there was not much wire, the ground was suitable for tank action, and the objectives were strictly limited. Despite these considerations and the intensity of planning, errors still occurred. For example, when the 15th Battalion reached Pear Trench, the tanks had not caught up in time. The result was that they, re that they faced resistance from the Germans in an area that was heavily fortified with machine guns and wire, ironically the place that the tanks would have been needed most in the first instance. The situation at Pear Trench was made even more unfortunate as it was the same division who had been devastatingly impacted by the tank action at Bullecourt and were therefore most skeptical of their worth. In addition, one infantry report noted that a tank strayed across the inter-battalion boundary near Hamel and subsequently fired into another battalion's position. Also, a tank report <coughs> revealed that the use of so many tanks on such a narrow front could be counterproductive as it was an incident where two ran into each other. In relation to dropping, dropping small arms ammunition, while ultimately successful, there are remarks claiming that some ammunition was placed too far away and other parachutes failed to open. One officer attributed this to the hasty modification of the bomb racks preceding the attack. The parachutes also had the potential to wrap around the wings of the aircraft, which happened on at least one occasion. It was believed that more practice and preparation would reduce the risk of this tactic and produce a more favorable outcome. Yet while these difficulties arose, none was fatal to the attack. The combined arms approach meant that there were many areas of support. If one element failed, this did not mean the objectives needed to be abandoned. 
Conferences held after the attack determined that the tanks could hold a greater responsibility to create opportunities for the infantry. Tank training was increased, and it was revealed that tanks could get closer to the barrage than the infantry, who were at risk of shrapnel casualties. Hamel was a big battle in miniature, involving the experimentation of tanks and small arm ammunition drops as part of a broader all arms offensive. While the combined offensive were not, was not necessarily a new approach to warfare, Hamel presented, represented the culmination of three years of learning and innovation. The flawless execution of the operation resulted in Hamel becoming a model for future operations on the West Front, Western Front, including the Battle of Amiens on the 8th of August, 1918. It sowed the seeds for success for the opera future operations in France, leading the Australians and the rest of the British Army to the stunning victory that occurred in the months that followed. Thank you. <laughs>